My name is Monica Wilkinson Kelly. I am the archivist at the Edith B. Ford Memorial Library in Oban, New York. This interview is being conducted as part of the Cuga and Seneca Lakes Agriculture and Craft Beverage Memory Project. Today is July 2nd, 2021, and I am interviewing Marty and Tom Mazinski, founders of Standing Stone um, in Hector. It's in Lodi. Lodi. Our mailing okay. address is Hector. But. All right, so good morning, Marty. Um, could you introduce yourselves? I'm Marty Masinski from former co-owner of Standing Stone Vineyards. And I'm Tom Masinski. And so, Marty, what was your background? Where were you from originally? Uh, we were both from Binghamton uh, and we were working there. I was a lawyer. Um, I worked <laughs> for IBM and I was, uh, by background, I'm a chemist. Oh, okay, chemistry. And um, so your education is obviously law school. And um, did you have any background or family background in agriculture? Absolutely none. <laughs> Tom, maybe a little. <laughs> um, not directly. My grandfather was a dairy farmer for quite a while outside of Cortland. Uh, so I used to spend a lot of time on his farm. But uh, uh, no... Um, no direct family history in agriculture, but um, certainly something that I was always interested in. Okay. And so at what point did you make this career change? <laughs> well, we kind of did it in stages. We bought this property in 1991, um, and we continued to live and work in Binghamton uh, because we didn't have the proverbial large fortune to just start a winery and throw everything into it. So we continued to live in Binghamton while our daughter went through junior high and high school um, and then so that would have been 97 she went off to college and then we moved up here Tom continued to compute back to IBM in various places <laughs> I'll let you describe that <laughs> um, the uh, as Marty said uh, we stayed in Binghamton for a while I actually uh, uh, stayed at IBM until 2006 um, at which point I retired with 32 some years there. Um, and uh, when Marty said commuted back, it wasn't just to Binghamton Endicott area. Um, I actually did a lot of traveling and spent a lot of time in Asia, which is probably one of the reasons why you see bonsai trees around <laughs> us here now. Uh, but, uh, um, and then when I left in 06, um, we were both full time here and essentially, um, Marty kind of ran winemaking and sales, and I ran vineyards and production. So, so when did you buy the property? We bought the property in 91, and then it was just about 10 years later, we decided that one of us really needed to be here. It was big enough, growing enough. We had enough we money needed, into it. <laughs> we had enough money into it, we had to watch out. So I sort of retired from practicing law because it was just too hard to do both things at once. Um, and became the on-site manager. Uh, and then, like Tom said, six years later, I said, we both need to be here or it's not gonna work. <laughs> and how many acres are here on the vineyard? The, the property itself is 125 acres. And when we bought it in two pieces, we had just about 20 acres of vineyards. And when we sold it in June of 17, we had 50 acres of vineyards. And how many, uh, what types of grapes are, did you plant initially? Um, well, the, uh, this is actually the oldest vinifera um, commercial site on Seneca Lake. It was planted by a gold seal back when they were um, in existence and were probably considered um, preeminent New York State winery at that time frame. Um, but they uh, started planting in 72. 71, 72 time right. frame. And they planted uh, Riesling, Chardonnay, which are the vineyards to the uh, west there. And then they planted Vidal on the other side of the road. And the story is that um, before choosing this site, Gold Seal had decided to experiment with vinifera grapes. Um, and they didn't want to fail. They were a big company. They just couldn't you know, sort of make it happen. So they supposedly had 100 test sites on Three Lakes, Cayuga, Cayuga, and Seneca. And after monitoring temperatures and wind and soil drainage for three years, 
they bought this property in October in 1991 or 1969 um, for $1,000 an acre, which was a lot of money for untested. I mean, what was growing here was Elvira's and Catawba's. Right. And the story is that the Catawba's on this farm ripened first. And so they chose this site hoping it would work. And it did. <laughs> they were right. <laughs> and so your first vintage was when? 94. 94. Well, you um, planted with, all the we, we sold, grapes. We sold, yeah. We, yeah, we sold grapes in, um, we bought the property in 91, sold grapes in 91 and 92. And 93 um, made our first that's vintage. Right. Right. And of course, the reason why Marty said 94 is that's when we started Open the selling. Chasing room. Yeah. <laughs> so, what was your production level? How many cases did you produce the first vintage? Do you recall? 800, 800 cases. 100 yeah. cases. 800. 800. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> um, and uh, when you sold in 2017, what was your production level? It was. It was normally bouncing between um, seven to 12,000 cases um, in terms of depending on what the year's like and what we needed to make um, sort of thing. But uh, um, the farms um, easily had a capacity for uh, uh, 25,000 gallons or so in terms yeah. of what we had in terms of production capacity. So as a chemist with a chemistry background, can you talk about the soil here a little? <laughs> um, the soils are actually very good. Um, it's largely a uh, honey oil loam soil. Um, there is like all spots in the Finger Lakes. It's variable on um, the structure and the soil depth. In fact, there is a uh, locust patch down at the west over there. And that locust patch is largely um, a large pile of sand that was dumped by a glacier as it was retreating. Um, so there's, things are variable in that regard. Also, um, our Gewurztraminer vineyard on the other side of the road, which we planted, um, the soil runs from probably three feet deep to about six inches deep until you hit rock depending on uh, how far down you get or how far uh, in the bottom of the vineyard you get. The, uh, it was originally planted by Gold Seal and the story was is that they uh, used dynamite to blast the holes in it at that time. Of course, dynamite used to be readily available in hardware stores back then. But, um, but, uh, but, then, the rest, but then the rest of the farm is um, fairly deep soils. Um, but uh, it's actually uh, worked out very good. Um, like everybody, we started putting in more and more drainage just for more consistency. Uh, we also were um, um, one of the few vineyards that had um, irrigation and we would pump water out of the lake and to use uh, Israeli drip irrigation system for the vineyards on the few years that we needed it. Oh, okay. And we found that was generally helpful about every three to five years. It was nice to turn the irrigation on. <laughs> well, and the rocks and the minerals add a great deal to the, the grape, to the flavor um, certainly, of the terroir. Certainly. Yeah. Um, and can you talk about the microclimate here? Um, go, you, have you heard the term banana belt yet? Yes. And okay. <laughs> this could is, you explain that? This is the buckle of the banana belt, um, but basically, um, the sites, it's roughly a little past Lamoureux, Mark Wagner's place, down to about Atwater, uh, is truly consistently just a little less cool in the winter. Um, we get the late afternoon sun and the, we're definitely able to ripen things a little longer. So that's why if you're, as you're going throughout the Finger Lakes, um, most of the Cabernet Sauvignon, which 30 years ago, I was with everybody saying, we can't grow that here. That's absolutely nuts. Um, it was one of our strongest grapes was Cabernet Sauvignon. But you won't get it ripe unless you're in this banana belt. At least not consistently. Not consistently. But the, I mean, the real, purpose, the real reason why the banana belt got the term was um, it's warmer in the winter here. Um, generally, the winds come from the west. We're over the east side of the lake. So it would go across the lake. The lake has frozen 
occasionally twice in the last 120 years or so. Um, and so unlike other lakes where they freeze and then they don't offer any buffer with heat, um, this lake is a very good buffer for those of us that are in the right spot. And what is the depth of Seneca Lake right um, the Well, is? up near Mark, it's Mark Wagner, which is Lamoureux Landing, about five miles north here. So, um, it's probably a little over 600 feet right there. Um, right here in front of us, it's about 400 feet. By the time you get south of Atwater, it's a few hundred feet deep. And if you've driven along the lake in the winter, you'll see that you can see the <laughs> south end of the lake will occasionally freeze. Uh, but up here, never. Yeah, so. there's a um, satellite map two years in a row taken on March 6th from Buffalo to New York City. And Seneca Lake is open and two thirds of Cayuga Lake is open and everything else is just Right. Seneca is the deepest of yeah. the oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Easily. Finger Lakes. It's a lot of water. <laughs> um, so what was it like to break into the industry you know, if you, as relative newcomers? Um, I don't think we could do it now. I think it would be harder now. Um, I think it would be harder to start a winery and a vineyard right now just because the field is pretty cluttered. But People were very friendly, very helpful. I mean, we were both good at doing a lot of research and um, we hired a winemaking consultant when we started. We had a vineyard consultant. So we did the heavy lifting, but we had people, you know, kind of outlining things. And I think in both of our careers, we were very used to, you know, thinking out several years, you know, what do, what do we need to do? What are we planning for? Um, and so we just, naturally did that and at one point we actually brought in a consultant that wasn't from the area and he was famous for walking us through like in March we would be planning out the fall harvest um, or thinking about tanks barrels whatever so that was something that worked out very well that our natural tendency to try to think what do we need two years from now and map it all out um, meant that we had time to maybe make some mistakes and fix them. <laughs> but also back then, the industry was quite a bit smaller. We were arguably the tw 20th or 21st winery on Seneca Lake when we started. Yep. Um, and I've lost track now, but I think it's pushing 80 now on Seneca Just Lake. Seneca. You know, if you go start you adding your, in, everything is going You had a farm winery license. Yes, we did. Yeah. We and did. so, well, do you recall your number? 783. Seven. That's the bonded winery, 783, the, the federal number. I don't, I don't remember a number associated with New York, um, but we were, yeah, you the know, farm when you figure license. that was, so that was bonded winery 783 with BATF and right. what they passed 10,000 wineries before we sold the winery. So it really has been very explosive, but it was, I, we used to have the industry, the annual conference that Cornell would put on that now has a fancier name used to be over in Cuca Cuca College. College and in the chapel I think we out the industry outgrew that maybe five years in but at that time you you could go to every winery and you knew everybody you knew vineyard winery tasting your people yeah. now we see people are like hmm, who's that <laughs> so um do, were there a lot of incentives that New York helped the None. industry no nothing at that time um well they did pass the farm winery um, act of yeah. course but that being said um and it the hurdles weren't brutal to get over to get a winery license um but they were certainly more difficult than they've become over time because they've kept making it um easier for everybody to get in, which is all in all a really good thing right i mean now everybody's so used to the governor's one-stop shop with sam filler and his cast of minions that help everybody and that didn't exist at the time right um, so in the period that you owned uh what 91 20 how many years 26 up? years 26 years um did you see a lot of technology changes that helped and yes. improved yeah yeah i mean obviously obviously the equipment just kept getting better and better both um, from a vineyard viewpoint and from a winemaking viewpoint um, but i think also the big contributor success or at least, um, for i think 
right up to the current time, but especially, you know, in the early days before when there weren't that many wineries in the Finger Lakes and totally was Cornell and Cornell Cooperative Extension. Oh. <laughs> um, I mean, between the support that they gave in terms of winemaking and research and vineyards, um, they really helped the, uh, the transition from getting away from um, the native grapes um, to better and better quality grapes uh, across the Finger Lakes. So they were, I think they were one of the big contributors to why this area has been successful. Yeah, yeah, people have said that, you know, who had no background whatsoever, just starting out, that they were able to bring grapes to be tested and oh, yeah. uh, had seminars. And oh, if it wasn't always. for the Geneva was always the Geneva Experiment Station. Right. Now it's right. Cornell Agritech. Right. Right. <laughs> I remember. But that. still, generally referred to as the station. The you station. Don't even have to <laughs> yeah. say yeah. Ag Station. You say the station. Geneva <laughs> Station. But yeah. yes, and then I think when we moved from Huca College, then it moved to Jordan Hall, which seemed huge, and then it's been outgrown from that for probably 15 years. It really is yeah. pretty impressive. So where now they're holding it, um, well, um, pre-COVID anyways, um, they would hold it at the RIT um, um, Conference Center up near... Um, U of R. Up near West Henrietta. Yeah. yeah. I guess it's grown. So, um, so the startup investment must have been pretty tremendous. It seemed to us at the time that it was. <laughs> That's why we kept our day jobs. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. But, but it's, we... I mean, the, the average, I mean, in general, the average winery expects to lose money for the first five to seven years. Um, everybody thinks they can beat that average. We certainly <laughs> thought we could. Um, we didn't. Um, no. <laughs> but in any case, so it really, I mean, if you really look at it from, if you start planting grapes, you've got five years from when you planted it to when you got your first full crop off of it. Then you've got another five years before the grapes really settle in and you know what they're going to be like on a consistent basis. Um, so it's a long-term cash flow. And it's just, I mean, equipment's, equipment's not cheap um, by any means. So it's, it's, it consumes a lot of cash. <laughs> and what was the greatest stressor? Uh... <laughs> the unknowns, I suppose, the climate. Do you, did you notice the weather? The climate? Yeah, I think the. I mean, you can manage it, but you know, knowing that the weather is a risk is is stressful. And, and one of the ways we managed it, for instance, you've probably heard about the great freeze of the winter of two thousand four, um, when everybody lost a lot of anifera, um, and mm. we got government, not crop it insurance because at that time was, uh, you tree couldn't insurance. Get it. so it was tree insurance the government did that but then required us all to get crop insurance which can become frighteningly expensive but we would just buy the minimum so that we if there was another catastrophic event and we needed relief that was sort of the qualification if you were going to get it again you needed to be protecting yourself but we also learned frequently to make maybe some percentage more of wine than we thought we needed for the following year, kind of make a year and a half supply, then we would adjust the next year. Okay, are we is, are the sales going really well? Do we need to do that again? And figured that that was some of our crop insurance. Because even when you get crop insurance for your grapevines, um, you don't have anything in the bottle to sell. And that was, for us, had been one of the biggest difficulties of that event was we had just sort of been reducing inventory to sort of rethink which varieties were working best. So we didn't have a lot in the warehouse to work off of. So that became our best way of planning for catastrophe. Yeah, which, fortunately, we didn't have one again. <laughs> yeah, we were affected by the flooding. What was it, three years ago? Or you had? We, we had sold. Um, and I don't think these, the there were some the vineyards, issues. The vineyards were not affected negatively at that time frame. Um, there was, I mean, some, there were some culverts that were washed out and you, kind of what would be considered a normal sort of effect, but it was certainly not normal to get nine inches of rain inside overnight, overnight <laughs> yeah. in this area. That was pretty unusual. Yeah, low dive really I mean, was impacted. I mean, up to that point, and I'm trying to remember what year it was. Um, 06 when we planted the when we planted, Riesling. We yeah, got so three inches of rain we in got, an hour. Yeah, we had just finished planting the field to the north there. 
and got three inches of rain. Uh, it washed out probably about a quarter of the grapes. So we went back through the mud and replanted them by hand. <laughs> they were and, laser planted, which was, <laughs> so, you know, so I don't think we did as good a job. <laughs> but yes, but in general, the weather's been fairly stable around here. Um, we've also been generally fortunate that we've never had a significant hailstorm. And right. I can certainly think of other areas that have had hailstorms really just um, decimate vineyards. Right, just yep. a little bit off the road last yep. year. Yep. Yeah, they lost half their crop. Yep. Right. Yep. From a, yeah, we, strange... we had hail, but never, it, at most, it thinned some grapes that we were going to thin anyway. So it, we were very fortunate on that. Um, so how many tons of grapes were you harvesting? Yet? Um, we would generally run um, between 140 to a little over 200 tons and it, um, for our normal harvest. Uh, we also, we sold a lot of grapes um, to various other wineries. And, um, and that was, I mean, one of the nice things about um, selling grapes is with grapes, if you're selling the grapes in October, you're probably, you're, you will be paid before January. <laughs> Um, and whereas if you're making wine, you're spending, you're harvesting the grapes in October. And then if you're lucky, you're selling some of it in May of next year, but you're probably not even starting to sell it till October. So right. it's um, a year later. So it's, um, and, and it so, helps with cash flow. Yeah. So you had a bottling, uh, works here. No, we here? Actually, well, we, years ago we had Early on, our we first did. bottling line we had bought from rolling vineyards. So it was ancient when they had it and more ancient when we got it. And so we actually talked um, Peter Otterson, I don't know if you've run into him yet, no. um, into putting the first mobile bottling line into effect in the Finger Lakes. Wow. And at that time, everybody thought that was a crazy idea. They were, you know, how are you going to schedule it? No, <laughs> we didn't have that door booked no. open. <laughs> you know, how are you going to schedule it? Um, everybody's going to be fighting for the same dates. And it was like, no, I think, you know, you look at other regions and people don't have their own bottling set up if they right. can get away with it and you have a good one available. So he did, a, he did a great job. And we basically committed that if he would put in the bottling line, we would do all our bottling with him for five years. So that gave him enough to make a business plan. Um, right. And he ended up, I don't know, moving. He's, he actually upgraded yeah. after 10 years, did a really nice upgrade, sold the other one, which is still in use. Um, so there's, so that was a great idea that we started. <laughs> so he would bring, bring it here, bring the production to you. Yes. And you would transport. And yeah. Right. You well, we would have the, he would pr pretty much back up to our tanks and then we would run our wine through his line and fill our bottles and stuff. So uh, basically all he functioned was uh, uh, basically an operational subcontract. Uh, right. He would come in with a bottling line, do that part of the operation, and then drive away, which meant I didn't have to clean it and I didn't have to uh, maintain, maintain it. it, which <laughs> yeah. was really good. Yeah. Or um, pay for it. So did the, um, w how do you feel, what was your um, greatest uh, wine you know what? What vintage are you most proud of? Uh, you have uh, one well, in particular. We have a couple of things that um, I think were. We, we were the first New York winery to get a score of ninety in the Wine Spectator for oh, okay. our Vidal Ice wine. Um, so that was pretty cool. And um, and we were the actually the the first New York State winery to get the Governor's Cup for a red wine, which was our Cabernet Franc. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, but then also in one of the things I think that will probably become more and more important to the Finger Lakes, um, we uh, started planting a grape from the Republic of Georgia called Separavi. And Separavi is, grows very nicely. It's very adaptable. It makes a really good red wine. Um, the Georgians think it will last 50 years in the bottle. Um, and we can't tell you that it lasts that long, but it, we've got some from our very early bottlings and it's still very good. And you're seeing more and more Separavi planted in the Finger yeah. Lakes. Right. That, it, I was going to ask you, that was um, kind of what I was right. hinting at. Yeah. I right. think I had read you were the first to right. plant In fact, um, it was a grape variety that was not recognized by um, USDA. Um, 
and so it was at that so with it not being recognized you could not use the name on the label um, so Marty drove an effort and with cooperation from Fred Frank and a few other people and we started a petition and got the information and Marty was able to get Separavi as an official recognized grape in the, uh, by USDA now. So, wow. And also um, re reading industry stuff, which we still do, um, the French have begun planting test plantings of Saparavi because they're concerned about global warming and they think Saparavi is just something that they want to look at just to see how it performs. So um, I think I think Saparavi is going to become more and more important. And what's nice about it, so it was always nice that we could ripen Cabernet Sauvignon and we could grow Merlot here, um, but the Finger Lakes will never be widely known for those varieties because only 10 miles worth of sites can possibly get them right. Even with global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it, we have still have those miserable extremes of super cold, cold in the yeah. winter. Um, Separavi, what they um, seem to be saying out of Georgia is that it grows everything from the top, top, top highest, you know, Siberian type of temperature growing conditions to, but a good part of Georgia is also sort of like the central coast of California. So it's growing in a wide variety of conditions. And it seems from, especially as Cornell has been studying it, it's as resilient to the cold, to the weather, it shakes off rain, um, similar to Riesling. So you think about, I mean, Riesling right. certainly is the signature grape of the Finger Lakes, not just because it, it because it grows well everywhere and even in what are known as the crappy years. If you hear somebody talking about, oh, 2000, 2003, 2006, 2009, it never got over 80 degrees, it rained all the time, it was miserable, the wines are going to be awful. Why winemakers ever talk like that? I don't know. <laughs> but you'd hear that and, and then it would turn out that those were the years you'd drink a 10-year-old 2000 Riesling, you'd be like, this is amazing and it's going to last another 20 years. So if Separavi proves to be the red Riesling, that will be a nice thing for a right. lot of what, people. What's the year, what, which, um, when did you plant them? I, well, 1994, right. okay. when we planted Pinot Noir, we planted two rows, about, what, 75 um, vines? Um, about 100, 120 vines is all. And we grew those for a few years just to see what it would do. Um, and then we did blend trials with other things and we also just we started there wasn't much available so we would take uh, cuttings from our vines uh, take them to um, a nurseryman and let him root them for us and then we'd buy them back so we just kind of kept planting more and more and right now um, we ended up with about seven acres in the ground that we had put in and we had a researcher from Cornell, he was actually Australian, he was on a, a um, I'll say sabbatical um, up here uh, to see how uh, we're doing things in New York State and at Cornell. And he knew Separavi from Australia, but he had it, but he also knew that, uh, he had told us anyways, that uh, we probably had the biggest single planting outside of the Republic of Georgia at that time frame. Because he knew how much they had in Australia, and even though seven acres isn't much, they didn't even have that much in the ground. And but. we actually had a funny story um, before we sold, probably five years, so maybe 2012, 2013. Um, we there was a big Georgian delegation that came to the U.S. promoting Georgian wines um, because they used to sell a lot of their wines to Russia or Russians, and that with everything going on there that was going away so they came to the u.s they were doing this sort of dog and pony show across the country and one of the guys that worked for us in the tasting room was going to be in dc at the same time anyway so i said why don't you go you'll taste some good wines bring back some information so he started tasting around and somebody asked who he was and he said i'm from standing stone vineyards we make separavi and they said oh yes we know that <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of funny <laughs> Was that challenging, you know, because the Finger Lakes is so known for the Riesling, trying to get people to taste reds was early on when you were planting? We, you know, we, we didn't have that much of them and it would all sell in the tasting room. So I think one of the things we did right early on when we were trying to sell wine wholesale to restaurants in New York, especially in New York City, is we just took 
what they would accept. So we took our Rieslings and we were able to talk about how good they were and how much variety. They're from dry to very sweet. And we could just stay focused on that. And eventually they'd ask, well, do you make anything else? Well, yeah, but it, that's just for the tasting room. And they would taste them. And you, you kind of had to let them pull it out of you. If you really went down and said, you know, I'm here with a Cabernet and you better believe this is good, you are not going to get anywhere at yeah. all. Because <laughs> I think people just assume, you know, Finger Lakes is so known for the Riesling. Right. That that's what they expected yeah. to drink and not willing to try. I and that's think. changing. I think right. uh, for a few years, the Wine and Grape Foundation, they had always done these sort of marketing efforts into New York City, and they hired this firm that really had a great approach. And the, the gal that was running the events would call all the wineries beforehand and say, I know you have a great this, that, and the other, but we want to project one consistent image of a certain quality let's just all bring our Rieslings and only talk about that. And they really did a good job of managing it. And sure enough, within three or four years, at those same tastings, you would have people asking to try everything but Riesling. And right. so even hybrids, even native grapes. So I think that that was a smart approach um, to sort of say, this is what we do really well. And let's just talk about that till we get our feet in the door. And it seems that some people just think of Riesling as a sweet. You know, right. If they don't like sweet, then I'm not, you know, and that's, right. I think, unfortunate too, because right. it's not just sweet. So, um, I've covered that. So, um, did you feel like uh, pressure from uh, the public to change what you were doing, or you really were committed, kept being committed to well, we were we always <laughs> it, you ha you have to set up your business model of what you want to be um, if you if you want to be a really big player um, and I mean there are certain people around here in the Finger Lakes like Bully Hill that's certainly a big player in the industry um, and they do a very good job we did not want to be a big player we also understood that if we were in the middle of the industry pattern um, that was probably bigger than we wanted to be and still too big to be or not big enough to do what needed to be done so we always tried to be a niche player uh, pick what markets we wanted to be in uh, pick what wines we wanted to make and then focus on those and that way um, um, as an example, you know, New York City and New York State's a good market to be in, but we are also in Boston, Washington, um, and a Ohio. number of other cities that are <laughs> largely places that we like to go into. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, um, so we tried to play it that way more than responding to what people wanted us to do. Yeah. Okay. So and we purposely, you know, Tom mentioned we sold a lot of grapes. That really um, happened about the, as he was transitioning to here full time, we made the decision that we didn't want to get bigger because we would we would have to you know double the operation, hire all kinds of people, buy new equipment, um, and so that's when we started selling grapes, and that's when there were more and more new wineries. There was a huge demand for grapes, so we could keep planting things that we know work well on this farm, and w there was always a place for them. You, you never had to keep a grape that we didn't want. So we could say, this is what we're going to make, and everything else is for sale. And did you have a number of winemakers assisting, assistant winemaker, or was it just a, one person? Well, you, were, you were the chief winemaker. <laughs> right. Um, and then we, you generally had one assistant um, yep. that worked with you. The uh, last assistant that we had, she's now the um, one of the main wine makers at Wagner Vineyards. Uh, she left here after we sold, went up there, and uh, she's doing a great job, which we, fully, her which we fully expected she would do. Yeah, she was great. But um, but as Marty said, you know, we tried to have for a number of years, probably stopping in early 2000 timeframe, consultants that would work with us. Um, and the last and the consultant, they really did a very good job for us. Um, he was a winemaker from Long, working in Long Island, um, but he was Australian and he made wine in Australia, New Zealand, a few other places. Everywhere, so he yeah. brought a lot of experience and really good suggestions to us. Okay, so and Marty, um, I'll ask each of you 
both of you the same question. Um, what would you tell somebody who's considering going into uh, the wine industry today, <laughs> having the experiences you've had? Um, I think, and we have, we've actually been asked and offered opinions that it's, that it's a difficult um, business. Um, it's a lot of fun, but if you're going into it expecting to make a lot of money um, or have like this steady supply of wine you want to drink, you've got to sell it if you want the money part. Um, it, you know, you really need to be clear about what you want from it. And if it's something you enjoy doing, you enjoy all the pieces, the, you know, the backbreaking vineyard work, the long nights and early mornings of harvest, um, the tasting room, if you, if you enjoy talking to the people and figuring out how to manage large crowds of people who know nothing about wine. Um, if, if you don't find something about all of those aspects that you like, then this probably isn't what you should be doing. You know, the fact that you like to drink wine does not get you there. And people think it's, you know, very glamorous. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> How many hours were you spending a day, you know, say during harvest season? Or All of them. I mean, we didn't we didn't track our own time, but we did. Um, Jess Johnson, the assistant winemaker for probably our last five years anyway. Yeah. Closer to 10. Um, we always paid overtime because I just didn't want to force people to be salaried and it's better for tracking. And she was routinely working 70 to 90 hours a week for about six weeks. And I also, so we were there. <laughs> I also wouldn't say that she was working more than we were by any means no, either. No, so it's just, it's, you know, harvest is what a harvest is. It's just flat out until when it's from when it starts to when it's done. In and that's fact, just Tom the way it is. Had a cot down in the press room. <laughs> so. That's a good story. That's something. <laughs> Didn't use it very much, but occasionally it was close to all nighters. <laughs> wow, yeah. So that that kind of diminishes the glamour vision. <laughs> but but at the same time, but I think it, we was... both felt that the days right. of harvest, when you know, I would get up and I, I would put pictures up. You know, it's four forty-five in the morning, and I'm showing the moon setting, and then showing the sun rising, and um, and just. I just, the times I was absolutely ecstatically happy were when I was getting up at 4.45 to ride the press or the picking, you know, the picking, you know, and pick grapes. It was great. <laughs> All right. So, Tom, same question. <laughs> um, very similar sort of answer. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to work in the industry, and I think that's very good because there's so many more wineries. Um, the, um, I think in particular, um, a good vineyard manager position is probably a much harder skill to fill right now, uh -huh. um, than a good winemaker. Um, but mm -hmm. so I, you know, if somebody was looking at it, I, and they liked both aspects of it, I'd suggest to that person that they focus on the viticulture side of it instead of the enology side of it. Um, because there's just, there are more and more vineyards being planted. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> that they, they require so much management and so much labor. So if you're a good vineyard manager, I think that you can bring a lot to the uh, table for the company that you're working with. Mm -hmm. So my final question is always, uh, would you do it all over again? I, I think I can say yes. Uh, there's obviously a lot we've learned and we probably would have staged it and ramped it up very differently. Um, but yeah, you do. It was a lot of fun. How about <laughs> um, if if the question is, would we? Because we made the decision to start doing this in about 1988 to 1989, um, and um, if you saying, and then it took us two years to come up because we wanted a good vineyard site, and this was one that. It took us a year of negotiations with the company that owned it. It wasn't owned by a person, it was owned by a company um, to uh, end up with the property. If I could start back at that time frame, yes. If it was to start now, um, I'd be a little more hesitant just because um, the mark, the industry has changed so much. It's gotten so much bigger. There's so much more competition. Uh, not when I say competition, not from the winery down the road because everybody's very cooperative yeah. Um, in the Finger Lakes. Yeah. But I mean, from a world viewpoint, you're competing against all sorts of wines from all sorts of places. So I'd be a little more hesitant on starting right now. Yeah. 
well, thank you for your time. I can't, is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything we left out? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, maybe being we're at the end and you can decide whether to edit it out or not. But in any case, um, one of the re I mean, this area has been an agricultural area since after the Revolutionary War. Um, the farmhouse on the other side of the road was actually the original farmhouse from the early 1800s that, that had the original military parcel that was given in this area. Um, this um, back in the 1920s and 30s. Um, this was, that was a peach orchard over there. That was a chicken farm. Um, and they had 40,000 chickens in that chicken farm, which is a pretty good sized chicken farm in that time frame. And they moved the eggs all out by using the Lehigh Valley Railroad, which ran through the property. Um, so it's just kind of, then it evolved toward grapes. Um, and so I think just by the fact that there's been so much agriculture in this area for so long, it's kind of people that like agricultural things try to figure out how to make it work. Right, and even uh, in Romulus, you know, when Sullivan's troops came through, right. um, they called it Appletown. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and there were, you know, I've been reading their journals and their entries are yeah. really fascinating. The, the peach orchards Peaches that were everywhere. there. Yeah. And, um, you know, and peaches are very difficult to mm -hmm. grow, so they were right. clearly taking advantage of the microclimates. That they and were supposedly able... chickens are sensitive, too, to weather, so that was the reason for chickens along here. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. Again, this is uh, Marty and Tom Mazensky, uh, founders of Standing Stone, and I appreciate your time spent here. Um, my name is Monica Wilkinson-Kelly, of the Edith Ford Library, uh, July 2nd, 2021. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you, Thank and good you. luck with the project. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>